Vaughn's story is brought to you in part by the Alice Clayburg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. Story, presented by Austin Film Festival. A look inside the creative process from today's leading writers and directors. This week's On Story, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, screenwriters and producers Amanda Silver and Rick Jaffa. In this episode... Amanda Silver and Rick Jaffa discuss the challenges of bringing the popular sci-fi franchise back to the big screen. We were writing. We were working for a very prestigious company called Working Title, really mm -hmm. smart people. Yeah. We wrote three scripts for them, I think our three best scripts. Even in the periods from Cradle up until The Relic, we were working a lot, you know, either uh, doctoring other scripts or... Uh, uh, writing scripts that didn't get made, but we were we were inundated with a certain kind of material, and so we made a conscious choice to try to elevate the kinds of material we were writing, and um, and so uh, working title um, had a, either approached us or our agents, I can't remember, maybe even a friend of ours, but when it came to Apes, the Rise of the Planet of Apes, it was our idea, and we insisted on being producers. You know, because at least we would be in the conversation uh, uh, when when things went down. We weren't thinking about Planet of the Apes yet, and Rick kind of went away for a couple of days with his files to kind of clear his mind and try and come up with an idea. And um, well, maybe yeah, you should I, tell the story because well, I wasn't I, there. I uh, I checked into a, a hotel in Ohio. And I, I took my box of files. You know, what's funny, too, is that I was headed to the room on one of those little golf carts, and I dropped the box. And, you know, papers and stuff went flying everywhere. And I thought, I thought it was a horrible omen, you know. And I, I threw it all back in the box. And, and, and anyway, I, I had everything laid out on the floor. And, and I, because it had flown out of the box, I'd kind of organized it in kind of subject matter. So I had, you know, sports stories and... Texas history stories, which, you know, I'm into that, and all these different piles, but I had a pile of the apes stories here, and there was a pile of genetic engineering stories nearby, and we've done a lot of stuff on that, and, and I just, my eyes just kept going to the different piles, and I, I landed on the apes thing, I said, man, there's just got to be something here other than like a cheesy horror film, I mean, it's just got to be something, and, uh, and then my eyes went to the genetic engineering uh, articles, and I just kept going back and forth, and literally a voice in my head said, it's Planet of the Apes. And I just like the story, I was like, oh my God, I've got it, I've got it. And, uh, you know, Chimp raised in a, you know, born in a, and by the way, uh, Chimp had been born in a, in a, in a uh, research lab. Mm -hmm. They didn't know the mother was pregnant. And I had that article cut out. And uh, I mean, it came together really quickly, so I, I gathered everything up, and I drove back home, and, and I she said, well, you know, Amanda says, well, so what do you got? Go. What do you got? You know, what do you got? Give I said, it to I've now. got it. I've one. got it. I know I've got it. And she said, what? And I said, we're going to reinvent Planet of the Apes. And she looked at me and <laughs> smiled. Nicely. And behind her eyes, I could hear her say, you poor dumb son of a. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's what you've come up with, you know, but, uh. The well, truth. no, as soon as I heard the story of this uh, chimp raised in a human home, we start talking about the story, and it's all about that character. You know, it's a Moses story. Mm -hmm. This character would be beloved in his home, have mm -hmm. a genuine relationship with the people who are raising him. They're not villains. Um, but he, he comes to see who he really is, where mm -hmm. he really belongs, uh, just like Moses, and uh, ends up with his people, and then leads his people to freedom. It was a character piece from the point of view of the chimpanzee. Right. And that 
we knew was really interesting. The truth is there was one very specific incident in California where a couple had adopted a chimpanzee, raised it, and there are pictures of this chimp dressed as a little boy and his own bedroom and sports things on the wall. I mean, it's in, you know, crazy stuff. And so eventually this chimp uh, attacked a neighbor and they had to take this chimp to a facility uh, where there were other apes, uh, one of these sanctuaries, but this was not a good place. Most of these places, by the way, are, are fantastic and they're run by really wonderful and heroic people with good hearts and stuff, but a lot of them are not. And uh, uh, this couple went up there to visit their chimp on its birthday and they were mauled. Somehow three... three oh, they brought a cake. They brought a the cake happened. and the whole deal. Right, exactly. And some of the apes had gotten out. Uh, no one's ever figured this out either. That's what's so crazy. This is what I love about this story. Just to give you an idea how twisted we can be. But somehow, they, this couple went up to the facility to celebrate their chimpanzee's birthday. At a cake, they were sitting at a picnic table. Four chimpanzees got out of their cages. They were watching from a watching, different cage. Exactly. They were watching from their cages. Two females, two males. And the couple's sitting there with the cake, and they see this flash behind them. You know, and another flash. And the wife turns around, and the two male chimpanzees are standing over them and attack the two humans. And th what they did to the male is unspeakable. Don't, please don't even, don't. <laughs> Although anybody afterwards wants to know, I'd be happy to tell you. <laughs> this is really crazy stuff. But just, you know, mauled this couple, and their chimpanzee sat there just quietly watching. No expression, didn't come to their aid, didn't jump up and whoop and scream, nothing, right? Mm -hmm. To this day, no one knows how those other apes got out of their cages. They didn't, there's like they somehow got a key or they, I mean. I forgot, it was some kind of more or less, you know, sophisticated lock system. But we always thought, well, it was their chimp. Like, you want to drop me off here? You know, you want to mess with me? <laughs> and he let the crazy ones out. And uh, it was a terrifying story, but then, so I, I cut it out and I cut several versions of it out and just kept it in the file. But then I would start, I started reading about other cases, you know, and there's a lot, it's pretty easy to find them. And so we were both really fascinated by it. Also, you know, this idea that uh, when we were raising two children who were at that time teenagers. Right. And it's just also this kind of fascinating parallel between you know, these chimpanzees hit a certain age, which is their equivalent of being a teenager, and hormones, it's just like our guys, guys. <laughs> you know, these hormones start bouncing around like crazy, and they start acting out and, and pushing the boundaries. They're and really, crazy. really strong. And they're, yeah. So it's, it's a kind of a fascinating parallel for human teenagers. So anyway, so we were fascinated by that. We, we cut out a lot of those articles. You couldn't use real apes. I mean, it would be... It would be a travesty to use real apes anyway because they're so um, abused when they're used in movies. But um, you could never get the emotion and the performance that's necessary right. uh, to make it play. But we didn't even think about that when we were pitching it. We were so naive, it really played in our favor. All we were thinking about was the story. And um, even after we sold it too, they kept saying, let me be really clear, Fox will never make a movie where the protagonist is a chimpanzee. And we kept saying, okay, sure, that's fine. Yeah, we, we got kept it. kept writing no the, the, the doctor's the protagonist. The, you know, the James Franco character is the protagonist. He um, was we, never the protagonist. Never. Yeah, and yeah, and even, I, I mean, skip way ahead, but even when they showed the film to Franco just before the premiere, he went to Tom Rothman, the chairman of Fox, and said, you know, you guys should put Andy's name above mine because he's really the protagonist. <laughs> it's like, oh, we were so close to getting away with that. One, you, know? <laughs> you know, add to the journey. But, you know, we were fired three times off of that movie as writers, which was really weird because we were the producers <laughs> at the time. We were the only producers for the first three years. And at a certain point, Peter Chern and his company came on. But, uh, um, which, you know, we would, they just kept firing us. They kept trying to make the script so that the human story was more interesting than the ape story. 
The ape story, by the way, is pretty much the same as the first draft. Caesar, Maurice, I mean, and, and the, the apes he meets in the, in the kind of middle section before he break out, they're same character, same story. But um, they kept trying, and we kept trying to do it for them to create a human story that was interesting, as interesting, as compelling. Right. And of course, it's structurally, that's never going to work because uh, Caesar is the protagonist. He's the character who makes the action happen. You can make the, the Franco character um, likable. You can give him some action uh, and some nuance. And the, the grandfather, I mean, John Lithgow gave a great performance, mm -hmm. but um, it's never going to be as compelling as the apes. And they were really worried about that. They were also really worried up until the week before it came out that the audience would be rooting for the humans like at the like end on of the, the movie br bridge, at the bridge example. we told them you know we've spent this whole movie building up rooting interest for it from the very first frames mm -hmm. where they you know for the apes very first scene you've got Caesar. humans attacking apes in their home and you know it's like it's it's really the the building blocks are there but we did reshoots the movie came out in august Amanda and I, on July the 4th, rewrote the ending. And they flew James in from North Carolina. I oh. put my wig on his head. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, we reshot it up in Griffith Park, that very end when Caesar talks to, you know, so that was not in Vancouver where we shot the rest of the movie. That was in Griffith Park. that dialogue and so you can only imagine getting the film ready from july the 10th or 11th to august the 5th the right before it's captured it was the animation no it's crazy space. and uh so and so we're in the editing room it's late at night and tom rothman the head of fox chairman of fox is literally head in his hand like oh my god my god what have we done what have we done you know like that and and he said i still i still don't know who the people are going to root for in this movie and I put my arm around him and I said, Tom, you know, Amanda and I have spent five and a half years on this thing. I'm telling you, when those apes are going across the bridge, audiences are going to be going crazy. They're going to be pulling for the apes. Right. I promise. You just got to, you got to trust us. <laughs> and of course, you know, they were. As we were writing it, we were very nervous in the back of our minds about how it would be uh, properly captured. As I said, they couldn't use real apes. Would animation get across what Caesar was really feeling, what Maurice was really feeling, what Rocket and Buck and the other apes were really feeling? And um, our script relied a lot on these expressions of anguish, of worry, the subtleties, the nuances of emotion. Um, and we very purposely did that. We wanted the audience to be in Caesar's point of view. We wanted the audience to relate to Caesar. When Caesar's looking in that mirror, thinking, he doesn't say, who am I? But you know that's what he's feeling. And it had to be in his face. Uh, when he asks his father, am I a pet? 
you know, what am I? You okay, pal? Are you a pet? No. You're not a pet. I'm your father. What is Caesar? It had to be clear, because if the audience wasn't in Caesar's shoes, the rest of the film wouldn't work. You wouldn't be in the ape's shoes later on in the movie, at the bridge. You know, you wouldn't be rooting for him to escape from, from the um, facility. So uh, we, we just, to be honest, we just went for it. We wrote it on the page, and we also created scenes in which you would know what he was feeling. For example, if he's in the cage, and he's looking out of the cage, and, and uh, the James Franco character shows up with a leash in his hand. Like, very little dialogue has to pass between those two characters for, for Caesar to look at that leash and to realize that if he's going to leave that place, it's going to be as a pet, you know, as a captive. Yeah, and by that point, you know, he'd moved on. He had, he had transformed. But, you know, we did not write, like, you know, uh, Maurice uh, uh, furrows his brow. You know, we didn't do those specific kinds of things. Um, when we got to, when we were writing the first draft and we got to the facility where the apes were, uh, we had a discussion because Amanda said, you realize we're about to write 60 pages with no dialogue, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and I was a bit naive and I said, yeah, it's great, isn't it? You know? <laughs> uh, but it's really challenging. And so point of view is really the key. And, you know, you, uh, as you, and, and construction. So as you build the character, uh, for the reader, it's going to become clear what that character's th uh, feeling. So we never felt, we never, we never write anything like, you know, man, is Caesar really sad right now? We, you know, you, we don't do anything like that, but you put him in a situation where uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's somewhat obvious what they're feeling, but then the reader of the script can project onto, onto the page or from themselves what, what they feel like the character's feeling. And then, of course, the actor comes on and completely interprets it in their own way. And, you know, and we were so lucky to get Andy because you know, the truth is, you know, we were going to have a stunt coordinator play Caesar up until about two weeks before the movie uh, where it was in production. And um, Weta, the, in the facility that did the apes, um, did the visual effects, had worked with Andy on Gollum and uh, uh, King Kong and, you know, all the Lord of the Rings stuff. And they started pushing really hard for Andy. And then, and so uh, he read the script and fell in love with it and saw a way to do it. Um, so it was a combination of a lot of really lucky things. Um, like Amanda said, the, the, the uh, technology didn't even exist when we first started writing it. And then Avatar was made, which allowed us to, to, to make our movie. Um, but the idea is really to kind of construct a dramatic situation where it's really clear emotionally what's going on with the character and then you know you leave it up to the director and the actors <clears throat> for example the scene when caesar gets beat up right. when he first shows up we were able to set the scenes without dialogue mm -hmm. um and show through action <laughs> By that time, everyone knows Caesar's an innocent. Right. You know, he's raised. Uh, he's you know he's an innocent character. Right. And who here hasn't experienced the first day of school? Right. I mean, it's terrifying. Right? right. And so when we got to that scene, we'll say, "Well, this is easy. This is your new kid in town. It's your first day of school, and the bully's going to beat the crap out of you. Right. You know, or at least scare you to death. And so there's a lot of that kind of. It's not a trick, but it's a little, a little bit of trickery there in that you know you. Because we also wanted everybody to be able to relate to Caesar, you know, especially if they've ever raised a teenager, if they've ever been a teenager, you know what I mean? 
uh, and so there's a lot of dramatic situations set up where it's really kind of obvious, you know, uh, uh, like I say, to the reader and then to the people interpreting the script, the actor, the director, the studios. And, and so the, the challenge is to find ways to show how Caesar is feeling. Mm -hmm. For example, he's, he's alone in his cell and he's looking glum. Well, you can write, Caesar's really sad, or you could have him do something to show how sad is he, he is. And so we had, you know, the attic room that he always looks out of, and he draws, he draws the attic room on his cell wall. Right. Um, and that is, uh, the audience understands that language. We have him draw the window. It was says what? Well, it says, God, I miss home. I love my dad. I'm the saddest person ever. You know, this is, this is horrible. I really want to go home. Get me out of here. And then his father shows up and says, hey, look, I'm really working hard, you know, and to get you out of here. And by that point, Caesar's character has progressed. So what does he do? He goes back to the cell and he erases the, you know, it's just really simple. He erases the drawing, which says, I hate my dad. I'm going to have to do this on my own. You know, I'm an ape, I'm not a kid, I'm an ape, you know? And so it's just really kind of simple math. <laughs> I think both of us, you know, like everybody loved the original and, you know, it's like the greatest Twilight Zone episode ever written, is, really. Yeah. And, written uh, by Rod Serling. And well, you know, Michael. it is. I mean, when we, we talked, the thing about Twilight, I mean, uh, Planet of the Apes, it's, you know, everyone remembers that uh, Rod Serling, you know, wrote it. But the truth is, you know, he wrote the first few drafts mm -hmm. and then Michael, Michael Wilson, Wilson, who was a great screenwriter, also blacklisted, came on and really did the lion's share of the work. What, uh, what Serling contributed was, is the one brilliant stroke that everybody remembers, meaning he was home all along, that he was here. And uh, in the book, the Pierre Bull book, was, that was not the case. It was literally like an alternative universe uh, where you know, apes had, uh, were ascendant and, and man was not. And so um, Rod Serling came up with the idea of, well, wait a minute, you know, this is classic. Of course he would come up with that idea because of all the you know, his history. Also the idea of the nuclear holocaust. Right. That's his thing. Yeah, he was really, he exactly. Was really, yeah, he was really into that. And, and uh, so that whole idea of, of, you know, nuclear holocaust and so forth. When Michael Wilson came on, I mean, strangely, it, uh, we were more simpatico with what he did, meaning that he was, you know, he was blacklisted uh, in his personal history. And even in, his, in some of his writing, you know, is always against injustice pulling for, the, for the, the underdog, the little guy, you know, that kind of thing. The racial undertones. And the racial undertones as well. So, uh, you know, he really came on and did, and did all that work. We did, it, it, we pitched it as an origin story for, for the franchise. And, you know, what we said was that, uh, you know, why don't, and we also wanted to be more science fact than fiction. Mm -hmm because of those genetic engineering articles, which I talked about earlier, and we did research. We, we talked to some uh, geneticists and we talked to people at Amgen. I mean, we, we really kind of did our homework. And so what, what we said to Fox was, let's take what's actually happening right now. So 2005, on this day in 2005, what's really going on that we can back up. And if the, we take those things and if the dominoes were to line up just right, and something were to just tip them over, they would start hitting each other, and we would end up with Colonel Taylor on that beach in 3978. And, and we had it. You've been watching a conversation with Amanda Silver and Rick Jaffa on On Story. 
For more On Story, check out our free podcast at onstory.tv or search the iTunes store. And get the book today, On Story, Screenwriters and Their Craft, on Amazon.